If you've been interested in NLP for a while, so you've probably heard about models like GPT-3, BERT or BERTA, and many, many more. All of these models are transformers. They share the transformer architecture, which is pretty, pretty damn amazing, I must say. So why is the title of the talk that huge transformers are not the way to go? So what I, plan, what I plan to do in this talk is to introduce a new concept called grounding, which I think is the future of NLP. So let's begin. First, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Uri Goren. I'm a machine learning consultant, and I specialize in natural language processing and recommendation engines. Uh, you can reach me at essentially goren.ml slash the media name, GitHub, Stack Overflow, LinkedIn, all of them should work. Um, I'm also a co-organizer at PyData and a co-host at uh, Amlek AI podcast. So if you're interested in, in podcasts, uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to introduce yourself to Transformers, for, for example. I started my way in computer vision uh, at Microsoft, uh, way before deep learning was a, a thing. Then I moved on to AT&T, did a lot of NLP on customer success data, and I spent a few years on Yahoo, mostly on uh, native ads and Yahoo Mail. These days, I manage Argmax ML Consulting, and I also do a part-time PhD at, uh, under Reut Tsarfati's uh, supervision. Okay, so a brief overview on neural nets uh, in case you have been like uh, living under a rock or something. Neural nets are like all the rage these days. Uh, and let's uh, see for a second how they work, like really from a bird's eye view. And uh, then we'll talk about transformers because you can't really not talk about transformers these days. And the third thing we're going to talk about is my prediction regarding the future. So I think grounding, natural language grounding, is the future of NLP, and hopefully I would be able to convince you why. So first of all, when I talk about NLP, I referred to uh, natural language processing and not neural linguistic programming, which is a too close, uh, too close concept. And from my perspective, natural language processing is everything that deals with texts either uh, machine learning, deep learning, etc., but also linguistics. So it's a good thing to settle this, settle this now because I think that, compu that computational linguistics doesn't receive the attention it deserves these days. And obviously, BERT and GPT-3 are on the intersection of deep learning and natural language processing, a very hot topic these days. So what are neural nets? Neural nets are just an optimization function that gets inputs in vector form and expected output. A neural net, also known as gradient descent programming, is essentially finding the best weights that optimized the outputs. So this is like, I think it's pretty cool uh, animation that shows how a neural net learns. And how do you fit an image into a neural net? The simplest way is to flatten it. An image could be seen as an array. For example, a, a two by two image could, could be seen as an array of four pixels. Each pixel has three channels, usually the R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. So we'll have two by two times a three. Okay, so that seems pretty straightforward when talking about images, but how do you squeeze a vector in? So, so squeezing, sorry, squeezing a word in is a, a bit more complicated, but essentially we map each word into a, into a vector. For example, the text I love you is being squeezed into, let's say, a three-dimensional embedding. So I, love, and you would all be mapped into a three-dimensional vector. 
all of them would be flattened and fit into the same neural net. Now this could be seen like kind of a magic or hand wavy, but it is like, a, I don't know, six, seven lines of code in Keras. So it's really that simple. And that's why the neural nets are so useful and so easy to use these days. There are plenty of architectures, uh, RNN, uh, DNN, CNN, you, you, you see a lot of them. Um, it's like a huge zoo. And all of the examples that I've shown this far, so far are fit forward neural network. But actually these days people do a bit more complicated things, but the main idea is the same. So let's talk about transformers. Now, if you're interested about transformers in more detail, uh, we did uh, an episode, Tamir Neve and my, my co-host and myself on the Amlek podcast. And um, I want to give you the motivation. Why do we care? Why should we care about uh, transformers? So world embeddings are cool, but the same world could have completely different meaning in different contexts. For example, we have the word bank here. Tom has been sitting at, uh, on the river bank for hours, or Tom was waiting in line at the bank for hours. One of them is the financial institute, and the other is a river bank, right? So completely different concepts. And if you use word embeddings out of the box, they're going to have the same vector, which is actually pretty weird. And you can think about Apple, the fruit versus Apple, the stock. And there are actually a lot of words that uh, mean different things in different contexts. So how can a word have different representation if it means something really different? So the main idea is to use something that takes into account the context. The, context. the simplest uh, model, I think the first model that has been used in this way uh, is called the RNN, a recursive neural net, in which in each step we take the output from the last step and concatenate it on and on, meaning that some kind of message is being uh, saved and transformed from one step to the other. RNNs are useful. In theory, they are like uh, the best thing you can do, but in practice, they have they have a lot of problems, like uh, catastrophic forgetfulness, because it's hard to pass a gradient for so long when the sentence is long. But nonetheless, you can use them to to implement things like autocomplete. Now, autocomplete, if you understand autocomplete, then you understand a language model, uh, give or take. So, for example. Tom was waiting in line at V. You have uh, all of the possible options. You have a probability for each word in the vocabulary. But in order to predict the next word, you have some kind of context. This, this is essentially the state vector that's being carried along in the RNN. What if we take this context vector and save it as the representation of the word bank Given the context we, we've seen so far, this is essentially contextual embedding. And this is the, like the root, the motivation for uh, transformers. Transformers are a bit more complicated than RNN, and they have something, they have a really surprising insight. In RNN, we actually care about the order. It is explicitly defined in a network. For example, if I'm going to predict the contextual uh, word representation of the third word, I have to run word number one and number two beforehand. In transformers, all of the words are being run in parallel and there are uh, various techniques to how to encode the position. Now, this, is the, this has the, invention, the advantage of uh, using the GPU uh, in order to parallel because CPU, GPU is a great, is great thing for parallelizing thing, things, and it's not the best thing for sequential processing. So that's like a technical perspective, but the surprising perspective is that because the transformer is essentially a pretty shallow network, you don't have to iterate over the entire sentence, you don't have to have a layer for each sentence, for each word in a sentence it can actually 
kind of bypass the vanishing gradient problem and it works. I think this is just the bottom line. It works like really surprisingly well. So the main transform I think that got everyone's attention is Belt and GPT-3 by OpenAI. Uh, GPT-3 is a ridiculously large transformer and obviously you cannot not mention Hugging Face, the authors of the Transformers library, the, uh, an amazing Python model. Uh, if you haven't installed it yet, uh, you should do it now. It's like it would make your life so easy. Uh, if you want to listen more, then go listen to our podcast. It's one of our uh, best episodes and most popular. Uh, we went through the history of from RNN, attention, transformers, and why is it good or uh, where can it be even better? Uh, GPT, GPT-3, essentially, I think it's like the first big transformer that got uh, the general audience attention. And it is really amazing. So for example, uh, we can see here a, a demo of asking GPT-3 to design a button, like a, an HTML element, a button that looks like a watermelon, and it actually created the HTML code, the React code, in order to display it. Now GPT-3, because it was such a huge model, it could actually learn new domains and new problem, new problems within like uh, less than 100 data points, which is uh, ridiculously amazing. It, it can also write poetry, create memes. You should really Google like GPT-3 examples. It, it looks amazing, but it's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> so unless you are like in one of the top five tech companies. Training GPT-3 is not really an option. And even using GPT-3, you cannot run GPT-3 on your laptop or obviously, or even on your server. It requires several GPU servers. Inference is pretty expensive. And I personally think that while big transformers like GPT-3 definitely work, this is not the way to go. So how can I make this kind of claim given the amazing results and demos that we see so far? So let's talk about grounding. So grounding takes bro borrows from the linguistic concepts of uh, pragmatics. Uh, in linguistics, we have four layers. At the, at the top layer, we have our pragmatics. Uh, which essentially looks down at the other layers of uh, linguistics, like syntax, uh, phonetics, and even semantics. And really it looks at the, end, um, at the end result. For example, let's say that I am a manager at a hospital, and I would like to convince my staff to wash their hands. And I would like to do so because there's a new virus, maybe you've heard about the COVID-19. And apparently just was washing your head, your hands with soap is, is enough. So since I'm talking about a medical, a medical concept to a medical team, I would need to convince them and would need, would need to explain why washing your hand with soap is enough. Maybe you need some other antiseptic or whatever. So I would say something like COVID-19 is an RNA virus. Um, since it, it is an RNA virus, it has uh, lipids and the soaps is enough to dissolve them and render it inactive because it's a virus and virus cannot be really killed because they're not really alive. So just wash your hands with soap, you should be okay. On the other hand, if I were talking to my five-year-old son, I would just say, use soap, it kills the coronavirus. I would choose, given the context and the listener, I would choose the path of least resistance, of least effort, when I'm generating the text. So if I know the context, if I know something about the listener, I know a lot about the text that I'm going to generate. This is the main assumption of pragmatics. Okay, so let's see how, how that will help us and how what does that have to do with pragmatic with uh, grounding? 
So let's assume that I want to understand, to parse instructions. And I have a very dirty sink with a lot of dishes and I want to get it cleaned. One way to do it is to mention explicitly all of the actions that need to be done in order to achieve the result. For example, pick up the soap, pick up the, the dirty cup on the left, open the faucet, uh, clean it and scrub it until, until it's clean. Or I could just say, wash the dishes. When I say wash the dishes, I assume a lot of things about the world and a lot of things about the listeners and a lot of things about the context. Right, so wash the dishes means different things in different contexts. In this, for example, in the kitchen context, it could mean those dishes, like a plate and spoon and a fork. If I were at a medical lab, wash the dishes could relate for another, for medical instruments, for a syringe or whatever. So the context is critically important and we need to find a way how can we ground the model and give it the proper context so it could understand the specific actions we're trying to achieve. So for example, if you're talking about uh, the cooking recipes, our context is essentially the kitchen. What we're trying to achieve is to translate um, this textual um, description, instruction, into a something that's a more formal language, for example, an executable code. Now, this sounds like machine translation, and as you probably know, transformers are great at translation. I think that uh, most of state-of-the-art models today for translation use transformers in one way or another. Um, but would that work? So, I can tell you from experience that it won't. For example, if you're trying to train a model to translate natural language into formal language, you're going to get something that it's not likely to compile, for example, something like that. But even if you force it and you play with the search function, it's still problematic because it can create programs that do compile, but mean nothing. And that's exactly what we can solve with grounding. So, how do we use grounding? Instead of trying to predict the instructions directly, we can supply the model a grounded word representation. So, for example, this image. Now, we don't have to supply this image pixel by pixel. We can also represent it as a vector. For example, what do we have currently on the countertop and what, do we do and what is currently in the oven or on the stove? and give it also the textual representation and train it to predict the resulting uh, world state, which is also known as gra grounded world state because we force the model to take into account my current context. Now, it's, more it's worth mentioning that by doing so, we do not only give it more information, we also we need less textual data and we can use a much, much smaller transformers and simpler models that could actually run on, on your laptop and, and also achieve better results. So this is an alternative approach, a grounded approach of our instruction understanding, instruction parsing, also called the semantic parsing. We give the prior world state, also the new instructions, and we expect, we train the model to predict the resulting world state. Much simpler and much uh, more efficient than using a huge transformer. Okay, so to sum up, uh, what have we seen so far? We talked a bit about neural nets and how to use it to, uh, to classify images and words. We talked about contextual uh, embeddings and how context plays a huge role. We talked about transformers and how they are amazing and achieve really state-of-the-art results and actually you, you cannot under, underestimate transformers but they are ridiculously expensive and when I mean ridiculously expensive is 12 million dollars expensive um, 
it's usually beyond the reach of, um, of most companies. And we talked about how grounding, which is essentially, it, it makes a lot of sense and it also can also reduce costs and simplify your model by giving it world knowledge instead of letting a transformer average its representation across all contexts that it sees in Wikipedia or the text it was trained on. So it can save a lot of money, it could make our model more interpretable, and it makes sense. It actually tried to illustrate the way that we humans generate language, given a certain context. So hopefully I convinced you that uh, grounding is uh, something that's worth pursuing, at least attempting in your next project. And I'm available on the chat if you have any questions. Thank you.